Okay, so welcome to the December Astro Seminars. I'm Heather Abbott Lyon. I'm the chair elect of the Astrochemistry Subdivision of the ACS. Um, with me today are uh, Parker Barra, who's the current chair of the subdivision, Kyle Crabtree, who's the vice chair and also our tech guru today, um, Ryan Fortenberry, our past chair, and our communications expert, AKA our secretary, David Roon. Um, we have a couple of announcements that I wanted to get started with before we dive into the talks. Um, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, it's linked on the Astrochemistry Subdivision website, or if you just search for Astrochemonar in YouTube, it'll come up. Um, but the more subscribers we get, the better, if we get enough subscribers, basically, we can actually have a channel with a link that makes sense <laughs> with the names link. Um, also, a reminder, abstract submission deadlines for the spring virtual national ACS meeting will open up next Wednesday. Um, we do have an astrochemical complexity and planetary systems symposium planned, so please consider submitting an abstract to that. Um, we will start accepting applications for the 2021 Astrochemistry Dissertation Award on January 1st. Um, the application um, submission will be open until about March. Anyone who's received their doctorate within the last two years is uh, eligible to apply, but you must be a member of the subdivision. Um, both the applicant and the nominator. The winner gets a $500 prize, is invited to present at the national meeting, national ACS meeting, and also gets a $500 travel award from the ACS Earth and Space Science um, Journal. Um, if you aren't familiar with them, Astrochemistry Discussions is another opportunity to hear about the latest science in Astrochem. They are done for the month of December, but they'll be kicking it back off again in the spring, so please check them out. Um, and then also we are looking for more presenters, especially for contributed talks in the spring. Um, you do need to be a, a member of the subdivision. So if you aren't a member of the subdivision and you're, you're coming to the Astro Seminar, please consider joining. Um, we would love to have uh, more members. A few quick logistical things. If you have questions as you're listening to the talks, please type your questions into the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, and if you are having technical issues, you can put those into the chat. We will read the questions from the Q&A, but we will check the chat just in case. All right. Well, today we are fortunate to have two great speakers. Um, our first presentation is going to be by Dr. Kelvin Lee. Um, and our second invited talk will be by Dr. Lucy Zuries. So Dr. Lee got his bachelor's degree from the University of Sydney, Australia and then went on to do a PhD at the University of New South Wales um, with Professor Scott Cable and Meredith Jordan, where he worked on velocity map ion imaging and quasi-classical trajectory studies of small aldehyde photodissociation dynamics. He then went on to do a postdoc with Dr. Mike McCarthy and Dr. Carl Gottlieb at the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard Smithsonian, um, where he looked at microwave spectroscopy of transient molecules. More recently, he joined uh, Brett McGuire's lab at MIT, where he's working on astrochemistry experiments. Dr. Lee has 30 peer-reviewed articles in high-resolution spectroscopy, gas phase reaction dynamics, astrochemistry, and machine learning, and he's passionate about open source and reproducible science, and we're delighted to have a contributed talk. So Dr. Lee, if you want to share your screen, you have 15 minutes, and then we'll do a brief Q&A after that. Sure, let me share. Oh, I can't share my screen. <laughs> Says, says host disabled participant share screen. <clears throat> ah, I'm the host now. All right, that yeah. should work. Let me, all right. So hopefully that works and everyone can see my slides. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you very much to Heather for the very, very um, gracious uh, introduction as well as the organizers for an opportunity to speak at this seminar. Um, I'm very excited to be able to share some of the stuff that we've been working on the last few months, uh, which I think, although it may be a bias, is quite exciting, which is applying machine learning algorithms to kind of uh, drive new discoveries in uh, astrochemistry. Um, so some of this work I did as a postdoc, uh, while well as a uh, postdoc at CFA, and more recently as a postdoc at MIT. So I wanted to start the talk by kind of putting the spotlight on uh, a very talented student that I had the fortune to uh, work with uh, over the summer, which is uh, Jacqueline Patterson, 
who was an RU student from Indiana University. And so I co-supervised her with Andrew Furka, who is also at the CFA, um, who, and, and Jacqueline really kind of pioneered the early work uh, that went into this, um, particularly kind of like the exploratory aspects of how we would develop such models. And so, yeah, without her kind of contributions, I wouldn't really be able to present the stuff we did uh, today. So to kind of start off, I want to give a very like kind of broad overview of you know, why we might be interested in detecting molecules in space. And so ultimately detecting new molecules, small and large, uh, kind of drive towards understanding like larger, more broader scientific questions of uh, the interstellar media. So for example, trying to understand, you know, the chemical origins of life, as well as, you know, the, the makeup of uh, matter um, in space, like for example, uh, interstellar dust, and ultimately kind of piece everything together and understand how everything behaves at a scale of, you know, galaxies and, and, and the universe, and ultimately understand how, you know, molecules that are a couple of atoms large ultimately contribute to the cycles of, say, for example, uh, birth and death of stars. And so why we want to detect new molecules is that because every single molecule tells a different piece of the uh, interstellar story. And so kind of just to show uh, where we're going with kind of detecting new molecules, this is kind of showing uh, a plot based on data that I parsed from uh, David Woon's uh, very, very uh, excellent uh, website on the detections of molecules um, as reported in the literature for the last uh, 80 or so years. And as you can see here, the total number of atoms, which is the, the average total number of atoms shown in the blue trace, not quite exponential, but we are getting to larger and larger molecules as, the, as time progresses. And that's owing to you know, improved instrumentation in both in terms of uh, observatories as well as um, laboratory measurements. And so the qu question at the end of every single um, the new detection paper is of course like, well, what do we actually look for next? What is a likely candidate now that we've detected a new molecule? And traditionally we've kind of been turning to kind of two sources of inspiration. One of which is like looking at laboratory assays. And so some of the work that I did while I was at a postdoc at the CFA with Mike McCarthy was kind of trying to drive discovery through um, looking at discharge uh, mixtures of interstellar precursors. So we take very simple molecules, apply a vol high voltage discharge, and we make new molecules based off that feedstock. And the great thing about this is that the chemistry kind of drives itself. So we can get kind of inspiration of what to look for based on the chemistry of related molecules. Uh, the complexity behind this, of course, is that uh, this is kind of taking months of work out of assigning um, data that's collected quite routinely overnight. So this is just showing a gigahertz of a lab spectrum of just ben uh, benzene discharge. And you can see that we get plenty of spectral features to analyze and plenty more molecules to uh, uh, come out of these spectra. And ultimately this of course takes months to, months of uh, dedicated labor to understand. The other way of going about this is to look at chemical models for inspiration. And so here, the chemistry is being driven by kinetics. Um, we put in rates and reactions of molecules and we let uh, the kinetics tell us what to look for. And so the great thing about this is that we actually get quantitative relationships by analyzing how these networks evolve as a function of time as we propagate them through time. Um, the trouble and or the complication behind doing this is that of course we need a lot of information about the reactions and of the molecules from the first place, as well as a very thorough understanding of what's actually happening in these interstellar sources. And as we found uh, as part of the Gotham survey of TMC1, new molecules are very uh, difficult to reproduce in current models. And so this is something that we need to improve upon. So um, hopefully I've kind of like illustrated the, the need that we have in going forward is that we need to be able to provide some way of guiding what to look for next in uh, all aspects of astrochemistry. And without poking too much fun into my modeling colleagues, it's this idea of uh, we need to start being more like preemptive in what molecules to look for, um, instead of having to rely on new detections kind of um, pushing or like 
expanding our models. Um, and as you can appreciate as well, probably, that as we get to more and more complex molecules, we can't possibly uh, uh, encompass every possibility. Here, Gromit is kind of laying down a single railroad. But the idea of getting to more and more complex molecules, we get more isomers, more reactions. Ultimately, the railroad can uh, branch off into many, many different pathways. And we can't possibly cover everything just using uh, our minds, I guess. Um, but the advantage, of course, is that computers can. And that's kind of the crux of this project. And so if we are to rely on computers for guidance, we need to first uh, figure out a way to represent molecules in a way that machines can understand. And so this, uh, I'd like to draw an analogy to um, something that people, a lot of people are probably familiar with, is the idea of like applying machine learning to uh, recommend uh, people things. And so in this case, for example, perhaps Netflix or whatever a movie catalog uh, service you're subscribed to, you watch certain movies and you rate them uh, positively. And the idea of a recommendation system is to find molecule, uh, sorry, <laughs> to find movies that are similar to the ones that you've rated well and recommend you based on those uh, um, scores. Uh, the analogy here, the analogy here uh, is instead of movies, we're looking at molecules. And so we know some molecules exist at some source at some level of abundance. And the idea is to recommend similar molecules uh, based on what we've observed in either a model a data uh, in observations or in the lab. And so what we're doing is we're, we want to represent molecules in a way that computers can understand and to operate on. And so we need to convert them into vector representations that kind of compress or encode uh, heuristics about chemistry. So if you want will uh, chemical intuition into a, a compressed vector format with the idea that we can then use this vector representation to relate it to observable properties like abundance. And this is something that's already been done in uh, high throughput drug and materials discovery quite widely and to a very large success. And so we're a little bit behind in that regard. Um, what we're doing with the uh, representation is we're using an unsupervised way of uh, compressing uh, information about a molecule into this vector space. And the unsupervised part of this means that uh, the model or the computer decides what's important about any particular molecule. And so to draw an analogy to uh, chess, the, the equivalent is learning how to play, the model learns how to play chess uh, just by observing many, many, many games of chess. Here, we're letting the model observe many, many molecules, diverse uh, bonding patterns, and it in turn learns to uh, predict what is actually important in describing a molecule. And the great thing about this is it's completely hands-free. I don't have to tell them a computer to do anything uh, or what to look for. It dictates all of this itself. I figured it was clear. Um, so this is kind of uh, the way we're doing this is using a, a model called Multivec, which is borrowed from a language model, a natural language model called word to uh, Unfortunately, I don't have the time to kind of explain uh, how this works, but the idea is that uh, through um, guessing and predicting what a missing atom is through all your, your entire uh, data or your library of molecules, it learns to encode uh, heuristics about chemistry into any arbitrary number of uh, dimensions. And the great thing about this is you can end up with something like molecule math, where each atom vector that you uh, get from this model, the sum of which gives a molecule. And so every molecule gets its own unique vector representation. So to train this model, we relied on a couple of different sources of uh, molecule uh, uh, enumerations. So the first uh, sets of more intuitive ones are from public databases of either quantum chemistry or uh, in the case of zinc-5, um, biological chemistry molecules, small biological chemistry molecules. Um, and as you can see, the, the, the size of these uh, data sets are quite large. Uh, com in comparison to our um, the chemistry that's actually known in space, either as a public um, chemical network like HEDA, or just based on uh, pure observational data like the Gotham observations of TMZ1. And so without duplication, we end up with about 3.8 million molecules 
to train and to predict off of. Um, and ultimately the model produces 300 dimensional vectors unique to every single molecule. And so it's not just once we have these embeddings, uh, what we actually want to do is try to visualize what's actually going on under the hood because uh, the models are not uh, directly interpretable. We didn't pick uh, or choose features, the, the model kind of picked them out themselves. And so this shows a, uh, a pretty picture of what uh, the inventory of TMC1 looks like, where the, lar the, the size of each circle gives you the uh, abundance of a, any given molecule. And the idea is this is projected onto two dimensions and we can try and uh, gain a kind of uh, an abstract understanding in two dimensions. And so you've got the cyanopolyines uh, to the right here, as well as other carbon chain molecules. And they're all clustered together in this uh, corner of the plot, whereas you have similar, uh, simpler molecules towards the left. And by far and large, the chemical inventory of TMC1 follows this dotted line, which I just drew uh, to guide the eye. Um, but it's these new molecules that we've been discovering in Gotham uh, that are aromatic molecules that kind of stray off the, the common path. And so that kind of in, um, implies to us that something chemically is special about these molecules that we're detecting that's not really kind of representative of the rest of uh, TMC1, but is captured by an unsupervised model. And ultimately, not, we're not just after uh, pretty pictures. Uh, what we want to do is also kind of in, in, um, inform how models can be developed or networks can be developed. And so in the green squares here, we're showing the KEDA uh, data uh, molecules in this uh, latent chemical space. And these uh, orange dots are molecules found in TMC1. This cluster up here corresponds to small transient molecules that we all know and love that are quite common in the interstellar medium. And you can see there's a big overlap between the TMC1 molecules and KEDA. However, down here is where the aromatic molecules are or the new molecules that we've been discovering. And you can see that the, the exploration in Keto or the space that Keto is comprising doesn't quite cover that area. So uh, this is definitely something that kind of like informs us that we should approve upon. So uh, now that we have the embeddings and we know that they do something vaguely chemical, uh, what we actually want to do is make predictions off of these embeddings. And so to illustrate a very quick, uh, overview of what we ultimately do is we take um, unique structures from all of our databases or any kind of source of data. We turn them into molecule vectors using our multivec method. We apply some um, dimensionality reduction and then we feed them into some machine learning model where it's then used to predict whatever targets that we're interested in like the column density or the, the excitation temperature. And this is all done in an unsupervised way. And we've tested a bunch of different methods, but today I'm only going to be talking about the Gaussian process results. And the idea is we want to apply this as a proof of concept to TMC1, where we have a very good handle on what molecules exist there. And to just kind of make it a little bit more uh, concrete, uh, we're treating this in a linear regression. X are molecule vectors, and we're trying to produ produce the abundances. Unfortunately, I'm running out of time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Uh, we then train off of the abundances of uh, molecules in TMC1, as well as constrain molecules we have no hope of finding. So for example, here, we know that the, the abundance of cyanopolyan chains decays kind of smoothly towards longer chains, whereas molecules like dichloro, dichloromethane, we have very little hopes of detecting towards TMC1. And so what we can do with this model is to validate on things that we know. Here, I'm showing the, the kind of trend of cyanopolyanes, and as you can see, uh, when I have uh, certain chains uh, excluded from the training data, we're still able to reproduce this uh, chain, uh, this trend in uh, column densities as we go to H up to HC11n. Uh, we can also apply this model to predict across the entire database and suggest new targets for study and include those that might not necessarily be uh, detectable in the radio. Um, and because we're doing this with a Gaussian process, we also have access to a covariance function. So this covariance function will be able to tell us how the abundance of any given molecule relates to any other molecule in a way that can help inform how uh, laboratory measurements or observations or models, how uh, any given molecule might uh, affect the abundance of any other molecule. Um, and so that really kind of quickly summarizes uh, the advantage of doing this machine learning method is we get a non-parametric baseline 
based purely on chemical similarity. We have no uh, knobs to turn apart from the, the base embedding. And all we're letting do, uh, the models do is represent uh, abundance as, as a function of uh, in chemistry, uh, in chemical space. And the great thing about this is it runs and scales very well. Uh, I trained all these models on my laptop and you can easily scale this up to clusters. So from the 4 million data, um, molecule data set up to literally hundreds of millions of molecules. Um, and we can improve on this somewhat systematically as well. There are some disadvantages to this approach. Uh, for example, our in embeddings aren't really kind of uh, directly interpretable and improving upon these models might not actually be so straightforward because we can't interpret them readily. And so to kind of conclude the talk, uh, what I hope I've shown is uh, we, using machine learning, we can drive new ways of finding new molecules in, in the lab or in, in the interstellar medium using a, a predictive a priori model. Um, hopefully with the idea of trying to complement observations, models, and lab studies. Um, that is also done in a way that can be very systematically improved with new data and new observations. And ultimately what I'm working on now uh, is in this GitHub repository, a object oriented Python API for people to use um, once I've published this work. And so I would like to thank NASA and NSF for uh, funding as well as Green Bank Observatory for giving us observatory time on, on to look, uh, for Gotham and Arkham, as well as all the people I've had the joys of work with over the last uh, three, four years. So, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, there are quite a few questions. So I will start and Partha, maybe you can help me go through some of these. The first question comes from Roberto, Roberto Nobles, and he asked, the vector representation of the molecule, which the vector representation of the molecule which information represent is like representing molecules with chemical descriptors. Yeah, so the descriptors that people are generally used to are discrete. So like choosing the number of carbon atoms number of hydrogen atom, number of aromatic bonds, and so forth. Uh, using the work to vec the multivec model, we're doing them in a, in a uh, continuous space rather than discrete descriptors, but they function in a similar way. The only problem is that we don't know which express, uh, which specific descriptors we're using. OK, the next question is from uh, Perry Haley. And she says, very nice work. Um, after PCA, is the clustering done? from the scores and Moholonobis distance, like the Simca or something else? Yeah, so after the PCA, we're doing a K-nearest uh, K neighbors clustering, and that's done using either Euclidean or cosine distance. Um, we, we played around a little bit with uh, which scores to use, but the main point of that is simply to reduce the actual number of molecules we're doing the predictions off of. Because we don't care about the 4 million molecules we only care about the 900,000 or whatever that's closest to the ones that we found in any given circumstance. I believe Professor Zuris has a question. Do you want to go ahead and ask it, Dr. Zuris? Yeah, I was wondering, Kelvin, does your program, is it able to take into account um, radicals and, you know, sort of unstable species that might not be in any chemical database? Yeah, so we're, we're doing the training off of um, uh, KEDA as well as the TMC1 inventory. And so as long as we can write out that molecule in, in a what's called a smile string, we will be able to kind of include it in this model. And so we've trained this off of radicals as well. So C3H or mm -hmm. that kind of molecule as well, we've included in this. I haven't expanded it to include isotopologs and vibrate like excited states, but it does do uh, open shell molecules. Interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this next question is from um, anonymous attendee. What do you recommend for someone who's interested in learning machine learning to eventually apply in astrochemistry? Sorry, I, I need to read that question a little bit more. <laughs> what would you recommend for someone who is interested in mach learning machine learning to eventually apply in astrochemistry? Well, I think for by and large, there's not much uh, things to, there's not many applications of machine learning in Astrochem just yet. And so you can really kind of go as far as you, your, your mind can wander basically. 
Um, so if, you're, if your question is more about where should I learn uh, things about machine learning, uh, you can kind of, there's plenty of like textbooks and you can contact me for uh, some details offline probably. That's probably best. <laughs> we can talk. <laughs> Leah Dawson asked, well, she said, very exciting methods. Do you worry at all about biasing your results given that your training sets are dominated by biological mechanisms? Yeah, so I, I, I can speak to that. That is a very good question. So the biological, this is actually the perfect slide for me. So um, what we're interested in right now is uh, models of uh, chemical bonding. And so the structures don't necessarily directly influence the results so much. It influences how the molecules are, are represented. And so what I would primarily, uh, the, the idea of this um, using these larger databases is just to get diversity in, in um, what constitutes a proper molecule. And ultimately you could probably do the same embedding training uh, using tra more transient molecules, but uh, those data sets don't really exist at, in, in the same quantity as these uh, public data sets do. That's the only problem. <laughs> the next question uh, is from Jan Sims. Um, he says, your model rates chemical similarity according to structure, I think, but chemistry is at least as much about the pattern of electronic energy levels slash structure. Is there any way that you can include that? Yeah, that's a very good question. So uh, it is exactly based on that. So the, everything we're doing, this is based off of chemical similarity through structure. Um, and that's kind of like where I was going with why these models are difficult to improve upon is that uh, this embedding with this embedding we're use, uh, producing using Multivec is very easy and very straightforward, but it doesn't capture nuances like the energy level electronic structure. And so to go and generate those embeddings definitely requires a lot more effort, but people are definitely there. That space is well explored by people who are professional machine learners. So um, yeah, that, to answer the question, uh, no, this method doesn't, but it can be doable. Okay. Um, Charlie Marcus asked, do you, do you find any correlations that were unintuitive or unexpected? Not that I've found yet. So, so the the nice things so far is that I guess it the the things that I've seen have kind of been reflective of, I guess my own intuition. Like for example, in this uh, projection uh, visualization, like yeah, how uh, the long chain polyines are kind of um, grouped together in similar ways. And so, like this is kind of like a ver validation as to how well the embedding is working. But so far, I haven't really seen anything that kind of like, why is that happening? <laughs> okay, this one last question before we move on. Does any chirality arise from your modeling? This is from Kelly Chance. Ah, so I'm for, I think I may, be, I, I, I may be wrong about this. I forget exactly. But I think uh, the encoding that we're using, unfortunately, doesn't represent uh, chiral molecules. And so that's kind of not captured in this scope. All right. Well, thank you for a very nice presentation, Helen. Um, we're going to move on so you can unshare your screen. And then, Professor Zuris, you should be able to share your screen. We're very fortunate to have uh, Professor Lucy Zuris as our invited speaker for this month. Um, she is a Regents Professor of Chemistry and Astronomy at the University of Arizona. She initially became interested in astrochemistry as an undergraduate at Rice University, where she read about the first discoveries of interstellar molecules. After obtaining her bachelor's degree from Rice in physics and chemistry, she received a DAAD fellowship to study at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy. She subsequently obtained her PhD from UC Berkeley in physical chemistry. After a postdoc position at the Five College Radio Astronomy Observatory at UMass Amherst, she became a professor of chemistry at Arizona State University in 1988. In 96, she moved to the University of Arizona as a professor of chemistry and astronomy and was the director of the Arizona Radio Astro Observatory, ARO, for 16 years. Her interdisciplinary research in astrochemistry combines both laboratory molecular spectroscopy and radio millimeter wave observations. Um, and she was awarded the Laboratory Astrophysics Prize of the American Astronomical Society very recently, 2019, um, as well as the Barbara Mez Stark Prize in Molecular Spectroscopy, although she has several, several other awards in her 
uh, credentials. She's a fellow of the American Physical Society and also the American Astronomical Society. And we're delighted to hear from her today. Everyone can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. It said I was muted for a second. Okay. So I'm going to shift a little bit of gears here from the first talk and talk about mostly some observations we've conducted as well as some laboratory work. Um, I want to thank the organizers for letting me talk. It was a very fun invita invitation to accept. And um, thank you all for, for joining and listening to this talk. So the topic of my talk is the unexpected chemistry in planetary nebula from CO to C60. And my interest in planetary nebula as a chemical source or something interesting to study in the astrochemicals field really began with what people were finding in diffuse clouds about 10 years ago. Now diffuse clouds, there's a picture of one there, are very low density regions. They have typical densities of maybe one, 10 to 100 particles per cc. They typically are 100 Kelvin, so they're relatively cool. And given these conditions and their diffuse nature, they've always been thought to be the regime of diatomic molecules only. However, over the past 10 years or even 15 years, observations have shown that diffuse clouds contain many of polyatomic molecules, such as formaldehyde, cyclic C3H2, CH3CN, and so forth. And a lot of this work was done by List, Harvey List and his collaborators who observed these molecules in absorption against background sources towards diffuse clouds. You can see them in emission, which is typically the way people study molecules in space with millimeter wave astronomy, because the densities aren't high enough to excite them. And so it was only observing them in absorption that they could be discovered. And so with the discovery of these molecules, it, began, it sort of posed a big puzzle because these molecules, these larger molecules, simply couldn't be created in diffuse gas. So where are they coming from? That's the question. And so some answer could be gained from looking at the life cycle of molecular material as presented here. And one realizes that the material in diffuse clouds chiefly comes from planetary nebulae. Nothing to do with planets, by the way. Um, contrary to what a lot of people think, only 10% of the material in the interstellar medium comes from supernova explosions. Most of it comes from planetary nebula which evolve from garden variety stars, one to 10 solar mass stars, which go through a phase where they've uh, depleted hydrogen in their core and they go through the giant branches and end up in the asymptotic giant branch. And then from there, they evolve into planetary nebulae. And so there are diffuse clouds, planetary nebulae and their precursors evolve stars. Now on this asymptotic giant branch, because the star begins to burn helium, I won't go into the details, extremely high mass loss occurs. The material is thrown from the star, stellar atmosphere, and it creates a circumstellar envelope around the star, which as many of you know, is very rich in molecules and in dust grains. And the star keeps blowing off its mass until it becomes a hot, ultraviolet emitting white dwarf nucleosynthesis seizes, and that's when the star becomes a planetary nebula. But the remnant circumstellar shell continues to flow from the star. The star begins to turn on ultraviolet radiation. Some of these stars get quite hot, 100,000 degrees Kelvin, and it begins to ionize the remnant circumstellar envelope. And so you start with a circumstellar envelope. This is IRC plus 10 Su16, a very same source and then you end up with a planetary nebulae. And this occurs, planetary nebulae live on the order of 10,000 years. The transition from the AGB to the planetary nebulae is about another 10,000 years. And so one, one wonders what becomes of this molecule and dust rich envelope as the star turns into a planetary nebulae. As we well know from studies of the very famous circumstellar envelope of the carbon star IRC plus 10216, the source is rich in molecules. Here is the spectrum from a survey we did at one millimeter. These are all the spectral lines from about 215 to 280 gigahertz. Very rich in molecules, these envelopes. Now, 
what happens to the material uh, has been studied by theorists. The ultraviolet radiation in a planetary nebula central star is very intense. And so all models of planetary nebula chemistry predict large scale molecular photo dissociation. And so the overall molecular content from the asymptotic giant branch phase steadily decreases in time. And so for example, here's a, here's a plot of, from Redmond et al of what happens to CN at about a the CN abundance actually goes up as the UV turns on from the central star, it reaches a peak of about 3000 years and then it rapidly decreases to 10,000 years. And here's a plot of molecular, a table of molecular abundances. One could look, for example, at HCN. You start at the beginning of the planetary nebula phase at four times 10 to the minus five. And by the time you reach 10,000 years, the, the abundance has dropped to 10 to the minus 12. So it is predicted that because of the ultraviolet radiation, molecular abundances from the AGB phase will drop maybe 10 to the fourth to 10 to the seventh orders of magnitude in time, except CO. CO stays pretty constant, and that's been actually borne out by observations by Pat Huggins and collaborators who observe carbon monoxide in maybe 100 or so planetary nebulae. But how does this connect back to diffuse clouds? Well, there was another problem that caused us to look at planetary nebula more closely, and that was what we were finding in the Helix Nebula. There is a picture of the Helix Nebula right there, it's one of the oldest planetary nebula known. The, it's close by and the material is flown away from the star. So the envelope is massive, a thousand arc seconds if you do radio astronomy. Um, and what one sees in this picture here in the red and orange is highly ionized gas, emission lines of N plus and O2 plus. The blue in the center is helium plus. That's a very ionized, highly ionized material. The star is the dot in the center. And this has been a source of CO and H2, as one might expect from the chemical models. However, about back in 1989, there was a group of people that actually found HCN and HCO plus at one position in this nebula. And that sort of puzzled us. We were wondering about diffuse clouds. We were wondering about the molecular content of planetary nebula. So we actually decided to observe a couple of polyatomics at that position. This was back in 2009, and we found formaldehyde. Here are five transitions of formaldehyde and asymmetric top. We also found cyclic C3H2. And observations done just a few years later showed that formaldehyde was present at many different positions in the nebula. You can see some of the spectra here, along with HCO+. Eventually, we did a complete map of HCO+, over 200 spectra over this large source. And here's the contour of the one to zero HCO plus emission, completely coincident with the N plus and the O2 plus um, ionized gas. So what's going on here? It looks like formaldehyde is, is ubiquitous in this nebula as well as HCO plus and cyclic, H, cyclic C3H2. So something must be going on in planetary nebula that the models aren't predicting. So that led us to a big survey examining the molecular content of planetary nebula. Our first survey involved 20 different planetary nebula. Here are their pictures and all the different names. We observed, we decided to pick some molecules, uh, polyatomic molecules, HCO+, HCN, HNC, CCH, as well as CS. We did some even more in-depth studies of some of the nebula. And this was basically the PhD thesis of Debbie Schmidt, my student, with pr uh, previous work by Jessica Edwards and Lindsay Zack, who all contributed to these studies. We did these initial observations with the telescopes of the Arizona Radio Observatory, the submillimeter telescope, and the new 12-meter telescope, ALMA prototype antenna on Cape Peak. And here are some of our results from this survey. We first look for HCN and HCL plus. Here are some of our detections of the J equals three to two transition of HCN. We also looked at the one to zero transition. We always did at least two transitions per molecule. Here's some spectra of HCL plus towards the various objects, some HNC lines, CCH. Here we see the three to two transition. The doublet effect is due to the spin rotation interaction. And then some HNC spectra. Here you see the three to two and the one to zero, which is typically what we observed. 
And interestingly enough, in many of these sources, we could determine an HCN to HNC ratio, which consistently across like 15 sources was in the range one to eight. Some of the objects we did some more in depth observations, such as NGC 6537, the red spider nebula, looks like a red spider here. It's one of the younger nebula, about 1600 years old. We found some molecules we expected like CN and CO, uh, CS, but then we found things like N2H plus, there's the three to two and the one to zero transition, formaldehyde, a few transitions, CCH. We even found 13 substituted molecules which gave us a 12 to 13 ratio of three to five, which is puzzling. And that's a whole talk in itself. We also looked at an object called M2-48. It's a middle-aged planetary nebula. Um, we saw the usual cast of characters, HCN, HNC, but what surprised us was the detection of SIO. There are three transitions right there. And then we also saw SO2 as well as SO. We never saw CCH, even though we looked pretty hard. Um, and we believe this is because M2-48 has an oxygen-rich progenitor star. And so its environment reflects an oxygen-rich chemistry, while many of the others reflect a carbon-rich chemistry, which goes back to the AGB star, which uh, formed the planetary nebula. But perhaps the most surprising nebula is K447. Here's a spectrum from IRAM. Uh, that we took recently. It is full of hydrocarbons and many carbon-13 substituted molecules. But in addition, we found some new polyatomics, things like CH3CN, H2, CH2NH, and CH3CCH. This has to be the most polyatomic-rich planetary nebula we've observed so far. We also saw mm, a series of U-lines, which we haven't been able to identify which are probably due to some unusual molecule that needs to be measured in the laboratory. Of course, that was 20 nebula. Was our sample really representative? And so very recently, we've gone on to observe another set of 10, 12 nebula. Here they are. One I couldn't find an optical image of. It was so obscure. That's a six gigahertz continuum image. And you can see many of them are very irregularly shaped, which is typical for planetary nebulae. And what we have found thus far is plenty of HCN and HCO plus. Here are some of the spectra. This is chiefly the three to two transition. We're working on the one to zero right now as we speak even. And in all of these 10 sources, we did find HCO plus and HCN, <coughs> except for one, which we only found HCO plus. And so now we have a sample of 30 planetary nebula. We've actually observed about 35. A few of the planetary nebula, we did not detect HCN or HCO plus, but we have about a 90% detection rate. And the detection rate is independent of the age of the planetary nebula. We're more, most like, we're likely to see HCN in a young one as well as an old one. And of course, additional observations have revealed many more chemical species in a few of these nebula even something like a recent one we've studied, NGC 6445 has cyclic C3H2, and that's a very old one. And so here's the current list of molecules observed in planetary nebula. You can see uh, many of them we were, have found in K447 and other sources, but what's also interesting is the presence of C60 and C70 in planetary nebula, the most complex molecules, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. So now we have enough sources and enough abundances to actually plot abundances versus nebular age. The dashed lines show the theoretical predictions, which show uh, orders of magnitude decrease in abundances. The red is HCN, the light blue is HCO plus, the dark blue is um, HNC, sorry, the opposite, and the green is CCH. They all decrease with age. The rest of the, dot, the, the plots, the, the dots and the stars are all what we observed. And you can see over a period of 10,000 years, the abundances for the most part do not decrease. So molecular abundances apparently <clears throat> are pretty much frozen in as the nebula, nebula evolves, nebula evolves. So how do we understand this? Well, we have rich molecule formation in the AGB stellar envelope. And then I didn't, I didn't mention earlier, but there's a period of about 10,000 years, 5,000, uh, 10,000 years called the protoplanetary nebula phase, which 
is when the star evolves off the AGB and into the planetary nebula. This is a very interesting phase because more violent mass loss occurs with non-spherical ejections of matter. You see that in the picture of the PPM CRL 618. And so this stage is associated with a lot of shocks, non-spherical outflows, and the onset of ultraviolet radiation. And this is probably what changes the molecular abundances from the AGB phase as the star evolves into the planetary nebula phase. Some abundances decrease by maybe a factor of 10 to 100, like HCN, this is what we found, but some molecular abundances are enhanced. For example, we have an increase in the abundance of both HCO plus and HNC as the molecule goes from the AGB phase into the planetary nebula phase. And so once the molecules, the abundant molecules it, or the, the star reaches the planetary nebula phase, those abundances are simply frozen out. There's short dynamical time scales, 10,000 years, and the molecules are able to survive because they form into self-shielding dense clumps. With molecular observations, we've been able to <clears throat> give the, uh, find the density of, of where the molecules are, or the gas the molecules are in, and it's typically about 10 to the six particles per cc. And actually the formation of these self-shielding clumps um, and achieving some kind of equilibrium in the planetary nebula phase was actually predicted in 1994 by David Williams, Tom Harquist, and, and their collaborators. So if you dig way back in the literature, you can find that perhaps this was predicted after all. So I'm going to finish my talk just mentioning a little bit about C60 and C70 in planetary nebulae and some experiments we've been doing in the lab. Now, actually C60 and C70 were first discovered in the planetary and a planetary nebula TC1. You can see a spectrum here, actual observations is in black and the predicted model predictions for C60 and C70 are shown in red and blue. And so it's definitely, this molecule C60 and C70 are definitely present in planetary nebula. Wonder, wonders how they are formed. How do you get pure sp2 hybridized carbon structures from gas that's basically very hydrogen rich and also contains a lot of oxygen and nitrogen. Well, there've been speculations on how these fullerenes form in these in nebula. Um, the proposed sources are PAHs, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, which are planar, or HACs, hydrogenated amorphous carbon. And these are certainly possibilities, but in either case, there's a lot of hydrogen around and you've got to get rid of the hydrogen to form fullerenes. And then there's a lot of folding strain that has to be accounted for. For example, if you take PAHs, you got to strip the hydrogen off, and then you got to start bending and folding them into a ball. And there's a lot of um, steric strain in that. So we thought about this, and I had a student that got very interested in C60, and we talked with our collaborator in the material science department, and we found out that for many years, it's been well known that heating silicon carbide releases silicon atoms and forms graphite. In some cases, it even forms nanotubes. But it requires typically a specific SIC crystal structure, which is called 3C cubic. 3C cubic looks like this. The silicon is the larger atom, the carbon is the smaller. And if you can imagine vaporizing the first three layers of the silicon carbide, you take the silicon off, and then you have an arrangement of six carbon atoms that just forms graphite naturally. This has been documented in the material science literature for years, and um, it's been actually used for, to create graphite for the semiconductor industry. Now, it just turns out that this 3C cubic structure is the type, is the most common crystal type for silicon carbide formed as dust grains in circumstellar envelopes. And we know that because people study meteorites, extract these grains from, meteor from the meteorites themselves, by looking at the isotope ratios, they know they're from circumstellar envelopes and that's the crystal structure in them. But to form C60, you need to form more than six membered rings, you must form five membered rings. And it turns out that if you have irregular silicon carbide grains and you heat it, the surface irregularities will call the cause the graphite sheet to pucker, okay? And they've actually seen formation of nanotubes and nanobuds from silicon carbide. 
So we were got very inter this, inter interested in this as silicon carbide, the three C crystal cubic structure was what's found in, in circumstellar grains and decided to do some experiments ourselves and to, to test this hypothesis by actually taking <clears throat> uh, sort of model silicon carbide grains with the three C cubic structure, comparable in sized interstellar grains and subjecting them to shock type conditions using a transmission electron microscope. We first did these experiments at Argonne National Lab and then at the uh, TEM at Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona with our microscopy uh, um, expert, Tom Zega, professor at Lunar and Planetary Lab. And this was all done, <coughs> prompted by my student, Jacob Bernal, and that's his picture right there. So what did we, we want, what basically what we wanted to do was subject those grains to conditions similar to what happens in the protoplanetary nebula phase with shocks and high temperatures and so forth. So under vacuum, we heated our analog grains to 1300 degrees quickly. We also bombarded them with um, some ions. And here are our results. In the side to the left, you see silicon carbide and you can see sort of a striations on the edge of it. That's the formation of graphite. The one box here is blown up in the middle, um, Picture, you can actually see silicon carbide and then striated structure on the edges. That's the formation of the graphite layers. It has a 0.34 nanometer separation. That's characteristic of graphite. And then you see on the edges little bubbles forming, little spheres and hemispheres. We believe those are C60. It's very difficult to image C60 in a TEM. And in fact, the only image I could find in one of the few images I could find in the literature was actually uh, C60 attached to a nanotube, and that's the insert you see in the middle panel. And you can see our little bubbles and hemispheres look exactly like that C60, and they have the exact diameter of C60. And on the right, you see another uh, slide where another picture done with the TEM where you see little hemispherical structures, the diameter of C60. And so we really believe that we can form C60 from heating Silicon, gar uh, silicon carbide grains. We've actually did another experiment just a few weeks ago where we just rapidly heated these analog grains with no um, ion bombardment. And we actually rapidly heat them. So here are some results. There's the initial silicon carbide grain. We rapidly heated it five degrees per minute up to 900 Kelvin. And you can see that the grain has changed completely. There's a little silicon carbide left in the dark black. And you see all of the spaghetti-like structures, which is graphite layers forming and distorting. And you can act, we actually took that up to 1,000 degrees. And here you can see the graphite layer actually folding and forming loops. And basically, the silicon carbide is pretty much gone. So do we really form C60? We obviously form graphite. We form hemispherical structures, maybe even spherical structures. And so to augment our observations, our, our laboratory work, we've also done some MD simulations. This is the work of my collaborator in material science, Krista Moral-Iridian and his student, Abhishek Takur. They actually did some MD simulations where they took a graph, layers of graphite in a sheet, and then they subjected it to a thermal and mechanical shock as one might find in protoplanetary nebulae. And after one shock, the sort of the graphite, the outer graphite layers begin to distort. The red you see is the formation of five membrane rings in addition to the six membrane rings. And uh, after one shock, we have about 222 five membered relative to 7,691 six membered. So there's a mixture here. And additional fragment, additional shocks done in the simulation begins to really distort the graphite and you get pieces graphite fragments, nanostructure fragments coming off the surface of the graphite. Here are some of them there. They contain both six and, and five membered rings. And finally, with another shock, you'll actually form a structure that looks like this, which has 12 five membered rings and 26 membered rings, exactly like C60, but it's not quite symmetrical and spherical yet like C60. And that's the next step in the simulation which we're working on, but we're getting pretty close. So in conclusion, 
I think our observations over the past decade have shown that planetary nebula are surprising rich in polyatomic molecules. And this material remains intact until the late planetary nebula stage. These molecules survive in dense self-shielding clumps, and these clumps are ejected into the interstellar medium from the planetary nebula, and they seed the material in diffuse clouds. And we believe this accounts for the presence of polyatomic molecules in diffuse clouds. And if you actually look at relative abundances, the abundances in planetary nebula are about 10 to a factor of 100 higher than in diffuse clouds. So you can imagine these clumps being ejected and they slowly dissipate within the 100,000 lifetime of the diffuse cloud and the abundances drop, but there's enough there to start that these molecules still remain. We know that the most complex molecules found in planetary nebula are fullerenes. And we believe we found another possible formation mechanism for the, for the, for the synthesis of C60 and C70 and possibly other nanostructures from the shock heating of silicon carbide circumstellar grains. And shock heating just basically um, evaporates the silicon and the carbon just naturally forms graphite. And then you also get the formation of the five member rings necessary for C60. Other carbon nanostructures are probably created as well. Um, unfortunately, transmission electron microscopy only looks at the solid state structures. So in the simulations, we see these fragments coming off that might happen as well. And these sorts of carbon nanostructures could account for the so-called diffuse interstellar bands, a big remaining problem in astrochemistry. And so I'd like to thank my group, in particular, Jacob Bernal and Debbie Schmidt, who did a lot of the work my collaborators, Tom Zega and Krishna Muralarinian. And I also want to thank NSF and NASA for funding and the Kuiper Imaging Facility at the Lunar and Planetary Lab at the University of Arizona and the Arizona Radio Observatory. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, if you have questions, please post them in the Q&A. Um, it looks like we have one. When you talk about the abundance of a certain species, uh, do they are they depleted mainly, and by which or which by which process are they mainly depleted by photodissociation? If yes, how do you estimate the photodissociation rate? Um, okay, you talk about the depletion of species. Do you mean planetary nebulae? Um, Yes. Yes, he says yes. Okay. So um, I don't, I haven't estimated the photo dissociation rate. Other people who did chemical models estimated a photo dissociation rate. The um, UV fields from a lot of these nebula are very well known, you know, so people can do the calculation. They know the distance of the material from the white dwarf star. So that can be accurately calculated, I think. Um, um, we don't see that much depletion, okay? That was the point of the whole set of observations that the models predicted that these molecules left over from the asymptotic giant branch, branch phase would be completely photo dissociated, and we're not seeing that. And we think it's because the molecules are in these self shielding clumps. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Kelvin, go ahead with your question. Okay, yeah, so. Um, when you're growing these nanostructures in the, on the silicon carbide grains, you mentioned right. that you can't like directly um, TEM the, the C60 or the C70. Um, could you ablate them and measure them in a mass spec? Yes, we could definitely measure them in a mass spec. Um, we could do a lot of other spectroscopic experiments. And then we did do some um, eels on this. I didn't have time to talk about it. But the best thing would be to sort of knock them off and do mass spectroscopic detection. Uh, you know, these TEM are commercial instruments, right? You spend four million and you buy it. So attaching a mass spec is not as simple as, as you might think. But you know, you know, the other option to try to see C60 is take some of the you know shocked samples and perhaps do Raman, and that might be something that um, 
you know, might be a little bit more, you know, e easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, I personally want to see the growth of nanotubes. There was one paper from 20 years ago that showed that growth. And so the second experiment we tried to do, we tried to grow them and then the machine broke. So I think if we see the growth of nanotubes, which we probably could image with the TEM, that's pretty good evidence you're forming some kind of nanostructures. Cool, thank you. Uh, there's another couple of questions. Sure. Is there any chance for atoms to be trapped inside? The yes, you, that probably must happen, okay? If it actually happens in a circumstellar envelope, there's, you know, you could probably trap other things in there. I, I, I'm sure it would happen. Okay, the next question is the center of the nebula will be hotter than the surface, then C60, C70 supposed to gravitate towards the center, then how can you explain their presence or formation in 100K? Okay, the center of the nebula is hotter than the surface, yes. You say they're supposed to gravitate towards the center. Now these are already, the grains and the gas are flowing from the star at about 20 kilometers per second. I think the C60 and the fullerenes would be swept up in the general flow. Um, and so I think that as they form, they're swept away from the star and so they're no longer um, at 100, okay, 100 Kelvin. Explain their presence or formation at 100 Kelvin. Okay, so what happens is that they are formed in shocks. The shocks probably, you know, increase the gas temperature to a few thousand degrees, okay? But the shocks go through and the material keeps, keeps moving out and it cools. So that's how I explain their presence. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions. Um, can I ask one? Can you perhaps um, comment about then about the top down versus you know bottom up synthesis of these large, large molecules? Well, okay. So um, we believe it starts with graphite, right? So you might consider sheets of graphite large molecules, <laughs> and so. Um, um, going to start with the top-down synthesis, okay? Um, the interesting thing is that you're going to, you know, potentially you're going to produce a lot of carbonaceous fragments, okay? And, you know, when we see a lot of cyclic C3H2 in these planetary nebula, we wonder whether its origin might be related to the breaking up of graphite. So you're going to get, um, yeah, you're going to get the top down synthesis. So we had another couple questions come in. Is it possible of synthesis of nuclei and stars similar to C60 or C70? Any possibility of synthesis of nuclei and stars? Um, what do you mean by nuclei? Um, oh, a nucleosynthesis. Any possibility of synthesis of nucleosynthesis in stars? Any comment? Is there any possibility? I, that's a very, um, Nucleosynthesis of nuclei and stars similar to C60 or C70. A nucleosynthesis synthesizes nuclei deep in the interiors of stars and the formation of uh, um, um, C60 and C70 is way outside the star. So I'm not quite sure there's a connection there. So I'm not quite sure I understand your question. <laughs> Okay, um, one, yeah. one, one, another question. Since it is well known that metal can catalyze carbon nanotube formation, uh, have you ever considered the role of metals in, uh, in catalyzing the formation of large carbon molecules? That's a very good question. And um, 
yes, metals have been well known to catalyze fullerene formation. Um, the question is, so you can imagine circumstellar grains, there are circumstellar grains that also contain metals like uh, magnesium and titanium, uh, iron, and that's always a possibility that somehow they're involved or somehow the silicon carbide grains aren't pure, you know, they may contain a little bit of iron, they may contain a little bit of titanium. And so that, that, that could happen. We haven't explored that, but that's a very good possibility. Okay, thank you very much, Professor Zarius, for your presentation. Um, everyone, thank you for joining us today. We will have another Astro Seminar on Wednesday, January 13th, and Dr. Martin Head Gordon is going to be our invited speaker. So please join us again and happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kelvin, for this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.